Awesome. So what we're going to do is now that we've kind of introduced nutrition, uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit more. We're going to break things down, realize through this nutritional chapter, we're not going to give too many specifics on how many cups of this you need to eat and, and really go into measuring your diet. We're going to more talk about why uh, certain things are important in your diet and then how to incorporate those in uh, with some easy practical <clears throat> ways uh, that isn't you having to carry around a bunch of measuring cups all the time. So um, we've talked about what essential nutrients are and all of these things. So we're going to start our conversation by talking about the, the macronutrients. Now our macronutrients are fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And so where we're going to start this conversation is we're actually going to talk about proteins first. So uh, when it comes to our proteins, proteins are important. They provide us with uh, four calories per gram of protein that we eat. Um, and one of the big things that happens with our uh, proteins is they help with hormones in our bodies. So hormones help regulate a lot of our processes and a lot of our hormones are protein based. So it allows us to um, work on our metabolism. It helps us to um, it helps us in the way that we feel and the way our body functions. And so it's really important for that. Uh, but even a bigger aspect of proteins is our body doesn't like to use proteins for energy, like um, to help us to to help us move and those types of things. What it likes to do with the proteins we consume is actually build structures. Um, your body is mostly protein. And so um, your, the protein that you consume, your body's going to use those proteins in order to, to make you. Um, if we stack proteins in the right way, uh, we get one thing. If we stack them in a different way, we get, we get another thing. Um, and so really to make you, proteins have to be present. Now, with that being said, um, we have these things called amino acids. And so amino acids are kind of the, uh, think about them as the building blocks of proteins. Uh, most people um, tended to um, play with Legos or some type of kind of building block as a kid. So think about building like a Lego castle, or maybe you built a Lego car, or you built something with Legos at some point. Well, all of you know that there are different types of Lego blocks. Some are uh, kind of rectangular, some are square, uh, different shapes and sizes, but they all stack together. And depending on which Lego blocks you use and how you stack them, you can build things like a car or um, a, a castle or anything else that you can imagine. There's all kinds of Lego um, designs out there. And so this is what amino acids are. They're the building blocks of proteins, and there are 20 amino acids that, that your body uses to build you. So think of it like 20 different Lego blocks. You have some squares, you have some rectangles, you have uh, just different shapes and sizes, and there are 20 of those throughout your entire body. And as long as we have these 20 amino acids, our body can stack them in the right way to make the uh, Lego castle. So kind of think of uh, you being the giant glorious Lego castle and we have 20 different amino acids making up all those different parts put in the right order. Now of those 20, of those 20 amino acids that we must consume or that we, that we must have in order for our body to uh, build all of our structures, there are nine of those 20 that we must consume. So there are 20 specific amino acids and there are nine specific amino acids that we must consume. Um, we call these our essential amino acids. So they're, the, they're essential in our diet that we have to get these. Um, as long as we consume these nine essential amino acids, our body's going to be able to create any structure in our body that it needs to. Now we can consume all 20. We do on a pretty regular basis consume all 20 amino acids but the nine of them we have to consume. The other 11, and again, it's very nine specific, the other 11 we don't necessarily have to consume. And so you may be wondering, well, how does the body, um, how does the body get the other 11? And so to kind of show you how the body gets the other 11, I want you guys to kind of look at this drawing here that I'll make. And so imagine we have an amino acid and we're going to make them kind of look uh, pretty simplistic. So let's imagine we have an amino acid that looks kind of like this. Okay, so it's connected. It's got kind of a head and a tail. And then imagine that 
uh, let's see, we'll, we'll go to red for this one. And so imagine we have one that looks over here, but it's a little bit different. So the color would represent that it's a little bit different. So let's say that these two are our essential amino acids. Well, um, these two are great, but maybe our body needs a different amino acid that we haven't consumed. So these are two of the nine we must consume. And then one of the ones we don't have to consume, one of our non-essential amino acids, our body's like, well, we need this in order to build something like, let's say your liver. Well, the body can actually take um, and it can kind of pull apart um, these amino acids if it needs to. And once it pulls those apart, what it can do is it can come back through um, and after it rips them apart, it can actually make a new one. So maybe it takes the, the head of this particular uh, amino acid and it cuts it off and it cuts the head off of this one. And then it goes back and um, puts that head over here. And then it takes and uh, takes the other head and puts it over here on this one. And so we've created two more. So literally your body is capable um, of, your body is capable of pulling apart some of the amino acids and redesigning them. So as long as we consume the nine essential amino acids, um, you'll be able to actually uh, make the other um, make the other 11. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. So that's one of the things we have to look at and kind of consider. Um, and so when we talk about amino or when we talk about our proteins, we typically talk about complete proteins and incomplete proteins. What do you think a complete protein has? Like what makes a complete protein complete? Um, it has like exactly what it needs to make up, like you said, like a liver or whatever else it needs. Yeah, so a complete protein has the nine essential amino acids. So um, any protein that has all nine essential amino acids, meaning that if I eat this one protein, I get all of those essential amino acids and I don't have to worry about eating something else, is considered a complete protein. Examples of complete proteins typically think about our animal proteins, so chicken and turkey and beef and, and pork, uh, when you, or even fish. When you eat animal proteins, you typically eat the muscle of that animal, and muscle typically contains all nine essential amino acids, and a lot of times also contains all 20. And so complete proteins are proteins we eat with all nine essential, and if we eat that one, we're good, we don't have to worry any further. We then have incomplete proteins, and incomplete proteins are missing something. And so they are missing at least one essential amino acid. Uh, they could be missing one, they could be missing eight, but they don't have all nine essential amino acids. Typically, our incomplete proteins uh, tend to be our uh, plant-based proteins. So uh, a lot of our foods have protein in it. So think beans have protein in it, rice has protein in it. Um, all nuts have protein in it. And so we have a lot of these plant-based proteins, but they're typically not complete. And so if we eat incomplete proteins, we have to be uh, a little bit more intentional about looking at those particular things and what we eat because we have to eat foods that um, will kind of complement each other. Um, so we'd have to eat two different types of food, making sure that we get all non-essential amino acids through the combinations of food because we don't have one getting it to us. And so when we have foods that combine together to give us a complete protein, we call those complementary proteins. Uh, so we have foods that um, we, we consume, and typically we consume these together, or people have learned to consume them together because when you eat them together, it creates a complete protein when combined. Uh, one example of this, people have been eating uh, two foods together for uh, probably hundreds if not thousands of years. Uh, you typically see these, these two foods together. Uh, you see a lot of in Hispanic foods and uh, kind of uh, think about groups of people who and what they used to eat that are centuries and centuries old. Uh, what are two foods that you typically see uh, people consuming a lot of that are very, uh, that are staple foods for a lot of people and they usually eat them together? What, what do you think two foods are that combine to make a complementary protein? I don't know about complimentary, but like all over the world, people eat beans and rice. 
That's a great example. So rice and beans, when, when those two are eaten together, they actually are complementary proteins. Each one of them is incomplete on their own, um, but eating them together makes a complete protein, giving all nine essential amino acids. So that's a great, uh, a great thought process and looking through that of seeing that, hey, people have been doing this for a really long time and they know it makes them healthier and that it's good and it tastes good. But the reason that they, they feel better after it is because it's giving them all those amino acids. Um, with proteins, uh, we do have, um, we do recommend an intake of 0.36 grams per pound of body weight, um, which means that if you weigh 100 pounds, you need 36 grams of protein a day. If you weigh 200 pounds, you need about 72 grams of protein a day. And this is one of the only recommendations I put in our uh, lecture, and that's because um, people want to know how much protein, and so it's there, but also uh, realize that most people get more protein than they need each and every day. Um, as Americans, especially Americans that uh, like their animal proteins, most people are eating way more than their uh, recommended or their required intake of protein. So it's something that most people don't really have to worry too much about, um, especially if they're eating animal protein. So from here, where we want to talk about is we want to talk about our next macronutrient. And our next, next macronutrient is fat that we're going to talk about. Fats, when we, when we look at them, um, fats are kind of um, good for us. They're, they're high in energy. Um, we know this because they um, are nine calories per gram. So for every gram of pure fat that you eat, there's nine calories in it, which is more than double that of our other macronutrients that provide calories. Um, the building blocks for fats, uh, we call them lipids. So lipids is kind of your building block for fats. There aren't different types of lipids. Um, it's just they can be arranged in certain ways to, to build maybe a cell wall or for just to build a fat cell. And so lipids do a lot of things for us. These fats do a lot of things for us. They uh, first provide us with insulation. We talked about this as subcutaneous fat. Um, literally, they sit underneath the edge of the, right underneath your skin and help keep you warm. Um, they help provide support. So um, all of your organs on your inside are supported by this thing called the mesentery, which is um, this web-like uh, thing of fat, and it helps hold all of your organs in place. Um, if I was to take and turn you upside down and shake you all around, you're not worried about your, your stomach falling out of your mouth or your uh, organs moving into a place they shouldn't. They, they pretty much stay put, and this is because of fats holding them in place. Uh, some animals don't have this, and if you were to uh, spin them around or, or flip them upside down, some of their organs may shift, and it could cause issues. Um, fat also provides... Wait, can you tell me an example of an animal? Um, I can't think of, of one right off the top of my head um, right this second, but uh, there are animals where their organs aren't held in place kind of like ours. Uh, they typically are animals that don't move around as much. Uh, they kind of are very stationary animals because they, they don't have to worry about that, that turning and flipping of things uh, as they go uh, forward. Um, yes, and so, yeah, sorry about that. It's just one of those of, uh, I can't think of some right off the top of my head, some insects are that way, um, would be probably your best example. Again, smaller animals, um, because they have their kind of skeleton on the outside and just kind of all the organs are in there. And so they can shift over time. Um, and again, most of those animals don't have to worry about it too much. They just kind of under the ground and kind of digging and don't have things that disrupt them in ways that would cause major incidents like that. Um, so vitamins are also important for, or sorry, fats are also important for some vitamin absorption. Um, so some vitamins we can't absorb unless fat is present. Um, and then the big thing with fats and the reason that we love fat so much is they add a lot of flavor and texture to our food. So if you've ever eaten a food and you kind of like the, the texture that it is, it's usually associated with the fat that's inside of it. Uh, they also provide a lot of flavor. Um, so I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a put of a cook, uh, named Paula Dean. Uh, Paula Dean is a successful celebrity cook, um, and people love her foods. Uh, but if you've ever seen Paula Dean cook or, or heard about a recipe of hers, uh, the first step in every Paula Dean recipe is add a couple sticks of butter. Uh, and then the end of that, there's usually adding some more butter. Um, and so she's been very successful at, at getting people to, to like her foods because she makes them flavorful with, uh, fats. Um, 
think about something you may have eaten for breakfast uh, this morning. Uh, a lot of people like to eat bread during their breakfast meal, uh, but most people don't eat just plain bread. Uh, they tend to put it in the toaster. And a lot of people tend not to um, just eat plain toast. That's not something a lot of people necessarily enjoy. And so a lot of people put butter on their toast because it gives it more flavor. And so you put a little bit of butter on some toast. It's way better than just regular toast. If you put more butter on that toast, it gets even better. And so this is one way to think about that flavor adding. And again, fats add a lot of fuel into our diet because they provide nine calories per gram. So um, with that being said, um, we have uh, different types of kind of fats in our consumption, at least in the way they're structured. And so we have saturated fats and unsaturated fats that we want to talk about first. Uh, do you guys know um, which of these fats is healthier for us? Are satur uns sorry, are saturated fats or unsaturated fats healthier for us? Unsaturated? Unsaturated. Do you guys know why by chance? I don't know. Yeah, so a lot of people don't. Maybe they've heard it in, in some kind of commercial. They've heard it over time, and so they don't necessarily know why saturated fats are uh, not quite as good for the body as unsaturated fats. So what we'll do is we'll go back to this kind of whiteboard, and I'll, I'll erase a couple of things here, and we'll kind of talk about and show you uh, realize this is a little bit of chemistry, but don't freak out. Um, you're not going to be tested over that. It's just as the example. So if we were to look at a, the chemical structure of um, a fat molecule, okay, it is a carbon-based molecule that kind of would look something like this if drawn out. And attached to the carbons on every side, we have some... Uh, hydrogens. It's taking me a little longer to draw this. It is not the easiest on this computer. I wonder if... Nope. Um, and so we have all of these hydrogens connected to these carbons. So in a saturated fat, we'll get to in a second of having this finished, in a saturated fat, this molecule is fully saturated with hydrogens, meaning that uh, currently in this particular model, there's nowhere else that I can add a single hydrogen uh, to uh, this particular fat, if that's making sense. So it's fully saturated. We're saying it's saturated with hydrogens. Now, when this happens chemically, um, it makes this a little bit harder to uh, break apart. Um, and so when we consume these, the body has to, to work a little bit harder uh, to break this apart and it, it stays a little bit longer. And so this in the long run over time, if we have a lot of these in the body, uh, it can lead to uh, worse effects from those fats uh, because the bot, it's putting excess uh, burdens on the body. And so uh, we tell you to eat you know, you can eat saturated fats, they're fine. We just want to try to limit that consumption, eat more unsaturated fats. And so when we say a, sat, a fat is unsaturated, it means that it's missing a hydrogen. Um, and so like we just did there, we, we erased this hydrogen at the top. And so now this is an unsaturated fat. And what this does is it creates chemically, it's a little bit easier for the body to, to break apart. Um, and so it makes it easier for the body to process, not causing as big of a burden. And so we encourage the consumption of unsaturated fats for this reason. Uh, we know it's better for the body. Um, with these unsaturated fats, we actually have two types. We have monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. What do you think the difference between a monounsaturated and a polyunsaturated fat is? Um, I, I, I know pollen is what's going on on these one. Um, yeah. I'm just, I, I don't know what to do with the fat so. Yeah, so mono means one and poly means more, basically many or more than one. So um, currently this example is called a mono unsaturated fat because it's missing just one hydrogen. If we call it, if we had a poly unsaturated fat, well, that means that we're missing um, at least we, we're missing more than one hydrogen, so it could be two, it could be three. Um, all it means is that we're missing more than one hydrogen. And so when it comes to this, 
polyunsaturated fats are even better for you than monounsaturated fats because with each hydrogen that that kind of um, is missing, um, we know um, we know that it becomes easier to break apart and easier for the body to process. Okay. And so we say consume few saturated fats, more unsaturated fats, and as many polyunsaturated fats as you possibly can. Now, um, I'll go back to the slide here in just a second, but there's uh, this process called um, hydrogenation. So uh, the process called hydrogenation that companies do. And this process of hydrogenation uh, creates what we call trans fatty acids, trans fatty acids, and so, uh, or trans fats. Um, are we, based on what you guys think or what you guys know, should we consume trans fats or should we stay away from them? Stay away. Stay away. Yeah, so we, we encourage people to eat zero trans fats. We want them to get zero. So you see that on packaging a lot of um, try to get zero trans fats in this product. And we want to stay away from those because um, trans fats are created through this process by companies called hydrogenation. And so that's where companies will uh, take um, a unsaturated fat like this one. And what they will do is they will chemically go through and they will add hydrogens to this particular um, fat. Now the reason they did this was to uh, allow these fats to uh, last longer, kind of like preservatives. It also changed the texture of foods and things like that. And so companies did this trying to make you want to consume their food more and like it more and so that it lasted longer on the shelf so um, it could actually cost you less. And so uh, this is the process of hydrogenation that creates trans fats. Uh, we know this isn't good for the body. It makes it really hard for the, for, uh, the body to break this apart. And so um, uh, we, we've said that these aren't good for you, and we've tried to back away from using these in products uh, companies have and finding other ways to get the same effects using uh, non-trans fats. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Yeah. Awesome. So yes. we so we have all of that going on. And so we do want to talk a little bit more about some fats. Uh, so uh, we also want to talk about cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is, uh, again, a, kind of a different structure for fat. It's a, Cholesterol is a way we measure uh, how much fat you have in the blood, or it's one measure of how much fat you have in your blood. We, we consume cholesterol in our diet. Um, and we have two different types of cholesterol we typically talk about. We have LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is considered uh, your bad cholesterol, and you want that number to be as low as possible. And HDL cholesterol is considered our good cholesterol, and we want that number to be as high as possible. Um, LDL cholesterol, the reason we consider it to be our bad cholesterol is typically uh, when we see LDL cholesterol in the blood, um, the body is taking cholesterol that we've maybe consumed and we're taking that fat, we're taking cholesterol, LDL cholesterol is taking fat to store it for later. So it's taking to store fat for later. And so we know that especially in high numbers, you're storing a lot of fat and this just um, has adverse health effects that we've kind of already talked about with high levels of fat. HDL cholesterol, on the other hand, typically is taking fat out of storage and using it for energy. So it's taking it somewhere to be used as energy. So if HDL cholesterol is high, it means that we're pulling a lot of fat out of storage to use as energy, meaning that we're, we're utilizing the fat we have and it's not just being stored there. And this is a good thing. Um, the best way to lower LDL cholesterol or bad cholesterol is through our diet. So eating things that are uh, low in cholesterol and don't have uh, necessarily high amounts of fat in them. The best way to increase our HDL is through exercise. Um, that's the best way to increase that. The more you exercise, the more you're going to pull fat out of uh, storage and use it as energy. Um, realize you could do everything right. Um, and uh, still uh, have trouble controlling your cholesterol. Um, and so some of it is related to genetics. Um, and so those kind of things are there with LDL and HDL. It's all a little bit different. Uh, it tends to be people of Greece, Grecian descent. So people that come from Greece or, or can trace their ancestry back to Greece. Their HDL, their good cholesterol, can be high 
even without a lot of exercise. Uh, we just tend to see that. Um, and then I don't know exactly what my background is. I know it's a little bit of Scottish, but there are some other things involved with that as well. But um, my particular genetics, I can do everything right, exercise a lot, eat right, and my HDL just remains very low for, for various reasons. Um, I've been to the doctor before, and um, every year that I go, I have my blood drawn, and they always are telling me my HDL is too low, even when I exercise a lot. Um, and it just happens to be kind of how my genes are. Um, and so all this conversation about fats, uh, what we really want to kind of focus on is the fact, is the fact that um, fats can affect your health. We've talked a lot about that in other lectures of the fact that um, fat in excess and in, in you know, excess and uh, when there's limited amounts of fat, both can be bad for your health and, and neither is, is a good place to be. And so when it comes to fat in our diet, we don't want to focus on just fat. We don't want to limit the amount of fat in a diet or increase the amount of fat in these tremendous ways. We just want to look at it as part of our diet um, and eat everything kind of in moderation. Um, and so we don't want to focus on any one particular nutrient. Um, we want to focus on what we're eating as a whole and looking at those things. Because if we eat a variety of foods um, in uh, moderate portions, and so we're eating all kinds of things all the time, we're, we're not going to have these high levels that, that are really worrisome. And so do be careful anytime you hear about diets that are trying to uh, take any one particular nutrient and either get rid of it or make it the only thing you eat. Uh, there are diets out there that basically limit how much fat and almost have you eat none. Uh, that can be hurtful. Um, and at the same time, there are fats out there like the keto diet, which uh, pushes eating high, high amounts of fat and there are sometimes medical reasons, very few medical reasons where something like this might be necessary. Uh, and your doctor would talk to you about that. But uh, the keto diet is causing lots of people to develop high cholesterol and they're eating large amounts of fat. And we know this isn't good for the body uh, in the long run or even in the short run. And so we have that going on. Um, so We've, we've kind of covered fats now, so we've got one more macronutrient to cover. The last macronutrient we need to cover is carbohydrates. When it comes to our carbohydrates, we typically talk about two types of carbohydrates. We have um, our simple carbohydrates, and this is a majority of our carbohydrates are considered to be simple, um, and these add sweetness to our foods. Now, realize there are different types that we can look at from Lactose is technically a uh, simple carbohydrate to, to glucose to um, all different kinds that can be a little bit more cumbersome, but they all are just simple carbohydrates in the fact that they provide sweetness to our food. Uh, they provide energy. Uh, so think kind of like sugar. They provide energy. They provide sweetness. And so they're all going to be broken down into simple uh, glucose in the body when we look at these simple carbohydrates. The other type we have is complex. Uh, there aren't quite as many of these in our foods. They are important, and we typically refer to our complex carbohydrates as fiber. And so we'll talk about what fiber is and, and why that's important. Um, in the conversation of carbohydrates, we typically talk about refined carbohydrates versus whole carbohydrates or whole grains as sometimes as they're referred to. And so we wanna talk about the difference between these um, and why they're kind of important why refined carbohydrates um, are different than whole grains. Um, between refined carbohydrates and whole carbohydrates or whole grains, which one are you told to consume more often? And why do you think that you should consume those more than the other? Whole grain and then fiber. Yeah, so whole grains are uh, told or we're told to consume a little bit more of, and you said maybe because it's they have more fiber, and that's that's not a, a bad reasoning. That is part of that conversation. A lot of people have heard that whole grains are better to consume than refined carbohydrates, but they don't necessarily uh, know why exactly. Maybe they heard it from, you know, Bumble the Bee from the Cheerios commercial or something, and so we want to talk about that. So, um, one of the ways we, we look at this is we need to look at a grain or we need to look at kind of a carbohydrate when it comes to our grains. And so this is a wheat stock and this is a wheat grain. Realize all grains, whether it's an oat or wheat or uh, barley or whatever it is, have three basic components of our kind of our plant uh, grains. We have an outside shell that 
um, is called the bran, and this protects the seed. It keeps it safe until uh, it gets into the ground and grows. We're thinking about what a seed is meant to do. And nutri nutrient-wise, the bran contains things like fiber, some B vitamins, some minerals. Um, we then have, uh, if, you, if you take off that bran, the majority of the seed um, is what we call the endosperm. And the endosperm is this giant kind of white looking section here. And the endosperm simply provides energy to the seed, okay? So when a seed is planted, it has to have energy to be able to grow out of the ground and sprout leaves uh, so that it has to have energy to be able to do that for the first process because um, there's no other way for it to get energy except through the seed itself. Once the, the, the seed grows and it sprouts leaves, the sun's going to provide it with energy and it's going to be able to continue to grow. But something has to give it that energy initially to grow, and that comes from the endosperm. And it mostly contains just simple carbohydrates, not much of anything else. The last part of the seed, which is probably the smallest part of the seed, is what we call the germ. The germ is considered a nutrient storehouse, but it's what's going to grow into the actual plant. The germ is what's literally going to grow into that wheat plant or um, the oat plant or whatever that is. And so it's really important for the seed itself, but it also contains a lot of different things, a bunch of different vitamins and minerals and kind of our unsaturated fats. So um, what, what part of this seed do you think a whole grain uses? So a whole grain would use the entire thing. It would use the entire piece of it. And so we're getting all of this and we're getting all of these nutrients. A refined carbohydrate doesn't use all the parts of this. It actually only uses one part. And the one part that a refined carbohydrate uses is called the endosperm. And so um, with a refined carbohydrate, something like a piece of white bread, they have removed the bran and the germ from the production process and are only using the endosperm. And so you see that we miss out on a lot of the vitamins and minerals that are contained in this particular product. And so realize when it comes to refined carbohydrates versus whole grains, um, when we talk about the energy in them, well, if we take breads that one whole grain versus one kind of refined carbohydrate, um, energy wise, they contain about the same number of calories. They both contain about 100 calories per slice. Uh, but we know that the other nutrients we get in there, like vitamins and minerals, are much, much different. And so this is why we tell you to consume uh, whole grains over refined carbohydrates because you, you get more of those benefits, bang for your buck kind of thing, and not just in kind of calories without a lot of other things mixed in. Uh, the reason that we have refined carbohydrates is they – um, tend to last a little bit longer. Think about a, a, a loaf of bread you have at your house that's uh, white bread. It may last for a few weeks without uh, before it spoils, uh, but something like a nice whole grain that you may buy somewhere, especially um, with the last couple of years, we've seen this change a lot, but uh, if you bought one a number of years ago, that, that piece of bread could go bad in uh, literally a day or two. We also tend to like refined carbohydrates better because they tend to taste a little bit sweeter and have a little bit uh, more of a pleasant texture. Um, the next thing when it comes to carbohydrates and kind of looking at kind of diet recommendations is there's this thing called the glycemic index. The glycemic index is uh, kind of looking at a way to control uh, what we call the sugar rush and crash. So think about... Um, if you people have seen kids eat a lot of candy and they get super hyper and then they kind of crash and, and slow down, uh, the idea of the glycemic index is that it's supposed to keep your sugar levels kind of constant throughout the day instead of peaks and valleys. Um, it's, a, it's a good idea. It's a, it's a good thought process and there, there's a little bit behind it, but at the end of the day, it's super complex and, and foods are constantly changing and the way this works changes person to person and even time of day. Um, and so at the end of the day, what you need to know about a glycemic index is that it's really a sham. It, it just doesn't work the way um, it's advertised to work. And so if you ever hear someone kind of trying to sell you on the glycemic index, I would tell you to, to kind of stay away and don't spend your money or, or really listen much to it. Um, and so the glycemic index, in my opinion, is kind of a sham and, and shouldn't be utilized really that much. Uh, it's just, it just doesn't work the way that it's advertised to. Uh, finally, with carbohydrates, um, one of the biggest things we have to consider with these in our diet is uh, what we call added sugars. 
Do you guys know what added sugars are? Like the no. um, artificial sugars? So they're not necessarily artificial sugars. That's a good guess. So added sugars are just simply uh, sugars that are added to products that aren't naturally found there. So a lot of our products, companies add sugars in them to increase the, the sweetness of them, or uh, sometimes we can't even taste that they're sweeter with added sugars, but they make it where we want to eat more of them and, and things like that. And so added sugars are simply sugars put into a product that we consume that aren't naturally found there. And companies do this a lot. You'd be shocked at how, how much sugar is in some things that don't even taste sweet, like maybe a spaghetti sauce or things like that. Um, and the reason that these are a big deal is we don't notice how much added sugars are in things. You can't always like taste it and be like, oh, this has a lot of sugar in it. And so when companies add a lot of added sugars to something, we may not realize it. And all they've simply done when they add sugar to a product is they've increased how many calories are in that. And so that can affect um, how much energy we're getting in each day and lead to weight gain over time. And we wouldn't even necessarily know why uh, because they can be hidden in so much. Um, and so that's our big issue is that added sugars don't add any nutritional value other than calories. And most people don't have a problem getting enough calories in their diet. Do you guys know um, what, what particular product that people consume may have the highest amounts of added sugar or uh, another way to phrase that is where do you think on average, like where do you think a majority of added sugars come from in an average American's diet? Sodas. Yeah. So our drink products, so Coke products, um, sodas, but also some of our just beverages in general, things like sweet tea, um, our fruit juices, a lot of these things have um, added sugars in them. Some of them have natural sugars, things like Coke and sweet tea, though, uh, have no natural sugars. So it's all added sugars. Um, and we know that there is a lot that comes through that. Um, orange juice has a lot of added sugar in it, typically. Um, and so one glass of orange juice, not bad, but if you get a really big glass of orange juice, there's a lot of sugar in it. Um, Cokes, a lot of people don't realize how much sugar Cokes have in them. Um, and so uh, one example of this is you guys probably have eaten pixie sticks once in your life. Like pixie sticks are great. Um, a pixie stick is simply a little tube full of colored sugar, has a little bit of flavoring in it. And so orange is the best flavor, pixie stick. Um, and you guys may remember those little paper pixie sticks you rip off the top and dump the sugar in. But I don't know if you guys ever remember the giant pixie sticks, the ones that were like a couple feet long. Uh, it was in like a plastic tube that had to be cut with scissors. Um, I loved one of those as a kid. It was a lot of sugar in there and, and it was delicious. Well, realize that that product is nothing but sugar. And a giant pixie stick like that, those big ones that you've seen before, weigh usually somewhere around 60 to 70 grams. Um, and that would be all sugar. So they had 60 to 70 grams worth of sugar in them. Uh, and you could do the math to figure out how many calories that is based on calories per gram. Uh, but realize, uh, uh, an average Coke that people consume has about as much sugar as that giant pixie stick. And people don't realize that that's a, that's a good bit of sugar. And think about you're, you're easily putting that down. And some people have a lot of those a day and how much sugar that's adding into your diet. Personally, I would rather eat the Pixie Stick than drink something like a Coke uh, just because, well, I enjoy the Pixie Stick a lot more than I would uh, that particular product. And at least you recognize that you're just getting sugar into your diet and adding calories. And so that's one thing to be aware with with our um, added sugars. Finally, we do want to go back and talk about fiber a little bit, uh, that complex carbohydrate. Uh, so with fiber, there are two types. There's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. Um, uh, foods have a variety of different, of, of these, a mixture of the soluble and insoluble. Soluble fiber means that it, when we say something soluble, it can dissolve in water. So soluble, fi soluble fiber dissolves and mixes in water. So if we put soluble fiber in water and stir it around, it kind of disappears in there. Um, where insoluble fiber doesn't dissolve in water. You put insoluble fiber in that water, mix it around, and it just kind of all will eventually float back to the top. You'll be able to pick it out. Um, both of these are important. They do different tasks. So um, they both help us. When you eat fibers, they mix into your stomach contents and they actually help you to feel fuller with less food. So 
um, eating fiber in a meal actually helps you to eat less because you feel fuller sooner, uh, causing you to consume less calories, which is a good thing for most Americans, at least for sure. Uh, the soluble fiber will then uh, dissolve in your stomach acid and you'll absorb that into your intestine uh, and it will help block the absorption of some cholesterol in our diet. Insoluble fiber will not dissolve in that water and will not absorb into our, uh, through our digestive tract. And so it kind of stays in our intestines and it works its way through. And insoluble fiber is a good thing um, for us because what it does is it adds bulk to our fecal matter. So when you eat foods, there are things that are left in your intestines and it works its way down for us to um, defecate those out. So think product in, we always have something that has to come out. And so insoluble fiber actually helps to add more to that fecal matter. And this is really good for your intestines. It gives them something to actually push against and work against. Um, your intestines don't like to be completely empty. Uh, it just causes them uh, some distress. And so fiber helps with this especially insoluble fiber. There are some foods that contain higher levels of insoluble fiber than others, and these are typically ones that don't break down a whole lot uh, through the digestive system. So if you've ever heard of someone saying that uh, uh, they've eaten corn and they've seen it in their fecal matter, um, or if you've ever experienced this where you look into the, to the toilet after using the bathroom and you see corn, well, corn has a lot of insoluble fiber and so it isn't broken down very easily in the body. Uh, doesn't dissolve in that water, and so that would be one source of insoluble fiber. So there are lots of sources of fiber, so um, we can get them through supplements. So there are fiber supplements like Benafiber. Uh, these are okay, uh, but remember with any supplements that we've talked before, supplements are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, meaning that um, they may contain what they say they do on the label, or they may not. They may have more things in them they may have less things um, and so we have to be careful with supp supplements most of your fiber supplements are are pretty decent accurate what's on the label but because they're coming through this kind of artificial way the body doesn't process them the same and so they're not quite as beneficial as eating them through our foods naturally so uh, we know things that um, a lot of our plant-based products have a lot of fiber in them. Uh, we know that whole grains have a lot of fiber in them. So things like whole oats um, are good sources of fiber. Uh, bran, so bran muffins or bran cereals have high sources of fiber and prunes are good sources of fiber. And so uh, some of these foods may not appeal to you. They tend to appeal towards older adults and this is understandable. Um, they tend to like them more. Um, uh, and the reason for that is the fact that um, Fiber, especially insoluble fiber, can make it easier to go to the bathroom. And so older people may struggle with this and they will, um, it makes it easier for them to go to the bathroom, may, maybe cause them to go more. So they consume prunes and bran more than maybe younger people do. Uh, there are also foods that have increased fiber added to them. So if you've ever heard of products called Fiber One Bars, uh, Fiber One Brownies, things like that, uh, those are food products where they've added some fiber into them. Uh, these aren't bad, uh, but again, they're not as good as getting them through naturally found in our fruits and vegetables and whole grains and things like that. Um, one caveat with uh, fiber is if you want to increase your intake of fiber, uh, I do encourage you to do that slowly. Uh, if you increase your fiber intake very quickly, uh, this could cause a lot of gastrointestinal distress, which could make it where you have to go to the bathroom uh, quite often uh, when you first start. So if you eat a whole box of Fiber One Brownie Bars, uh, they are delicious, and I'm not saying I've done this, but uh, you may be visiting the bathroom uh, a number of times that day because that fiber is processing through uh, your digestive system, causing you to go to the bathroom a little bit more. And so this kind of uh, finishes up our carbohydrates. And so we finished up our um, macronutrients, the ones that provide us with energy directly. And so where we're going to move is into our uh, micronutrients. So we will start talking about those 